Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming today on this beautiful afternoon to be here with us. The title of my talk is, Are You a Builder? But a builder of things. What, what, is, but what is a builder? What is a builder of things? Let me tell you the story of how I came to know what this means. I was born in Panama. It's a small country in Latin America. And my mother, she worked programming the large co computer mainframes that powered this very large organization. Because she was into computers, she brought home one day one of the very, very first IBM personal computers, which was the precursor to every other PC made since. This was very, very early on. And when, when you booted this computer without uh, operating system and it didn't have a hard disk, it would boot up into this interpreter for this language that was uh, Bill Gates' favorite language called BASIC. Because one day she brought home from a business trip this other book called Kids and the IBM PC. It was, uh, it was a book that was for kids about how to program this basic language. And you could build simple little programs, and it was for kids. And uh, I devoured this book so much that I still, 40 years later, remember these illustrations it had of the little robots moving around numbers inside of cardboard boxes to illustrate uh, the concept of variables. This is also 1991, uh, 1981, and uh, this is when the video games first started to explode into popularity. And the way that you had to play these games is you would go to these video game arcades, right? And then you would uh, take out 25 cents and put it into the slot, and then you would play. And this was the only way you could play. But these games were designed to make money, so they were made for adults to play and for teenagers to play. And I was a nine-year-old little kid. So when I would play, I would excitedly put out my 25 cents and start playing. And within 40 seconds, Pac-Man would go boop, 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 boop. And, or Mario would get smashed by a barrel on the second level. And then I was done. And this was a problem. You know, the, I, my entire allowance every day was 25 cents, so I could only play. Can you imagine only playing video games for 40, 40 seconds a, a day? And so this is a problem. And why, my friends would, you know, what do I do with this problem, right? So my friends would address it by trying to figure out how to go buy games in the US, which was the only place you could buy them. Or they could go to these convoluted ways of pirating the game to copy them, to run it on their PCs. But for some reason, that was not what my instinct to do was. I said, well, I have this problem. I want to play video games. I can't. And what can I build to try to fix this problem of mine? And I learned this new thing, how to write basic. And what does this mean? What can I do with this? And I, because I couldn't play video games, I would read magazines about them. And I read in this magazine this interview with this guy who they asked him, the interviewer asked him, so why isn't this game do this thing? And he said, oh, that's a good idea. So he turned around and then sat on his computer and wrote a bunch of numbers and then the game did that. And then this, as a nine-year-old kid, this blew my mind because that means that wait, this game is just made by a person, and I can do this too. I can, do, I can learn how to do this. And so little by little, I would read magazines, and I would think, oh, what can I do with this idea? And then slowly start building up these games, space games and little games of cars moving around and bugs crawling around. And when I would run into problems, I would try to think, oh, well, this is a problem, but what can, I, what can I build instead? What can I do to, to fix this problem? And so when I, for example, it was fun to have computer opponents, but I didn't know how to code algorithms in order to uh, create an intelligent opponent. So I recruited my little brother and designed the little game to play against him. 
And, you know, and then that was actually more fun because now you have a multiplayer game and it was more fun to play with him. And then pretty soon I could recruit my cousins and then the eight of us would hunch inside in this one keyboard, all tapping on the key, trying to make each other's Tron light cycles crash into each other. And this was the first memory I have of recognizing this instinct inside of me that when there is a problem, when you see something that is not quite right, that could be better, that could be improved, that there's a hole in the world that, that you know, video games are missing from my life, I would ask myself, what can I build to fix this? What can I build to fill this hole? And when learning something new, that was also the first time I remember that every time I would learn something new, I would think, oh, well, this is great, what can I do with this? What does this mean? What can this become? And, you know, I am not saying that there's something special about me. I was just a kid in Panama, a nine-year-old kid, just learning things. And I think that this instinct, this, this vocation, exists in all of us. I think we all have this builder inside of you that responds, what can I build to fix this? We just have to learn to follow it, learn to listen to it. But, you know, it's very easy to sometimes forget and ignore it. And that is what happened to me. By the time I got to high school and started applying for college, I got too wrapped up in all the you know, what career, what major should I have? What career should I have? Which university? I should go to? How much money am I going to make if I get this job? And you know, what's the best, coolest job to have? What are all the cool kids doing? And then I lost sight of, of listening to that builder inside. So much so that when I finally got to grad school, this was 1991, and the World Wide Web was just invented, right? Somebody invented that. And the first, uh, this is Mozilla, the first uh, browser that could do uh, images. And I was in the lab one day, and this classmate came over and said, Jaime, check this out. I built this uh, web page. And look, it was a picture of his, him as his pretty girlfriend, and doing something goofy and gray background, you know, nothing. And I just, maybe because I was jealous, because I didn't have a girlfriend, I just dismissed it. I reduced it. I said, dude, that's just a document viewer. You downloaded this document over the school network and you're just showing me the document. What's the big deal, right? This is nothing. Obviously, it was something. And in the lab next door were the guys building Yahoo and the first wave of internet giants. And I missed it because I didn't listen to that instinct. You know, the world became different, the world changed, and I, I, I miss that change. But it's very easy to stop listening, it's very easy to ignore it. My friend uh, was also in the same university, and he uh, was also in the lab one day, and this guy, this lab mate, also came over to him and said, Hey, John, check this out. Look what I built. This thing counts how many links point to each web page. And it ranks the web page. Therefore, when you search for a page, it gives you the best ones and not the bad ones. And then he'd also kind of stop listening and he, he dismissed it. He reduced it again. And he said, oh, well, that's just a search engine. Why do you need a search engine? We already have Yahoo and Alta Vista and Excite and all these other search engines. The world doesn't need another search engine. But guess what? The world did need another search engine. And that guy showing him was Larry Page, the founder of Google, showing him the first version of the search engine. And he also, you know, missed it. Luckily, uh, we learned from our big mistakes. And we started listening. We graduated. We started working for companies and started thinking What's, what's new? What, is, what can we build? Why, why, how is the world changing? And 
the next companies that we started working for were wireless internet companies because the, wire, the internet was great, but how great would it be if you could use it while you're out and about and seeing the world? So we both worked for wireless internet companies building the next generation of networks. And then when these new things, social networks started coming out like Facebook, and they were opening up, and we looked at those and said, oh, well, what can we build around these things to make them more fun and make them more useful? And we did. We left, the, we left our jobs and we started a company to build social apps around these companies. Eventually, the iPhone came out. And then this is a new thing. This was, this was exciting. People were using the iPhone to take lots and lots and lots of photos. And then there were these new things like Instagram where you could post those photos and share them. But there was a problem. The, we saw that there was a problem that you could, to edit these photos, to do something cool with them, if you're just even comparing two photos, put them side by side, you had to put the, phone, the photo on your computer, figure out how to use a complicated program like Photoshop, figure out how to use the tools in them, the lassos and the layers and all these things. And you just wanted to put two photos together and then post it on Instagram. So to solve this problem, we built this app called Picolage that was built around the joy of not having to figure out the user interface. It was the, the, the phone had this touch screen. And so we said, well, what can you build with this? Why don't we just make it so you just move it around with your fingers? So, so we did, and, and there, it did fill a hole. It was something the world needed. It needed an easy way to fix your photos, to do something fun with them. And now, uh, 12 years later, uh, Picolage has been used by over 300 million people. And we built a team in Taipei to keep asking ourselves that question, what can we build to make thing, the, taking photos easier, editing photos easier. What can we build to make people, allow people to be more creative? And when something new comes out, we don't dismiss it, we don't ignore it. When this new AI technology, such as uh, DALI and ChatGPT come out, we ask ourselves, oh, what can we build with this? What can this become? What can we do? What, where does this lead to? Steve Jobs once said, the world around you that we call life was, ma was made by somebody who is not smarter than you or me. Therefore, you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people use. I wish that somebody had told me that when I was graduating from high school. It took me a while, 40 years, to realize this, but I want you to think about the, when this happens, when, you, when that builder inside of you pops up and it asks you, oh, you don't like this, this is not quite right, there is a hole. What can you build? What can we build to fix this? What can we build to fill this hole? And when something new shows up on you, and somebody shows you something excitedly, and you, ask, you find that builder inside of you asking yourself, asking you, what can you do with this? Where does this lead to? What can, you, what can this become? That you don't ignore it. You don't reduce it. But instead, you run with it, you, 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 you listen to it, you follow it, you make it your vocation, you make it your career, you, 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 and that, you know, is how, you know, become a builder, become your career, be a builder and build great things. And that is how the world changes. Thank you.